Welcome to Cognition's next conversation. I'm Tony Caggiano, the Chief Medical Officer at Cognition Therapeutics, and today we're here in Boston at the Clinical Trials and Alzheimer's Disease meeting. We're here with Dr. Philip Shelton and Dr. Willem DeHaan, who are leaders of our SQL trial, which was using quantitative EEG to measure the effects of CT1812 in participants with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. So, uh, Dr. Sheltons, maybe you can tell us as we designed this study with the founders of Cognition many years ago, what your thoughts were and why it was designed in this way and what we're hoping to get out of it. Yeah, so it's an interesting question. Thank you, Tony. So, when I was um, sort of informed about this particular drug and the mode of action and uh, the target that they were thinking of, I always think in terms of when you, when you think of a trial and you design a trial, I always keep in mind what is the drug actually doing, how does it work, and what is the target. And so they told me this was typically sort of a drug that actually acts on synapses, synaptic function, and should be quick acting as well. And so I thought, well, the best way to measure synaptic function and the synapses are the connections between the neurons is actually EEG. I mean, it may sound as a a very old-fashioned method, but it's actually very sort of, uh, I would say, um, modern method to, to look at the connectivity in, in the brain as a function of the function of synapses. And then we also thought to increase the power actually and to have less people needed in the study and to give everybody the chance to have the active drug. We do a crossover design. So we treat them for four weeks, then we cross them over to placebo and vice versa. So we get a lot of data actually on the effect of the drug compared to placebo on this very, very sensitive method, which is EEG. Wonderful. So Dr. Dahan is our neurophysiologist uh, who knows more about EEG than the rest of us. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, what is interesting about EEG, particularly in neurodegeneration, in dementia. Sure. Yeah, so in general, uh, we're measuring uh, brain activity. And of course, with EEG, we're measuring from the outside. So it's a patient-friendly method. But we have to realize that we are measuring at a large scale. So we're measuring the activity of well, millions of neurons at the same time, with a high temporal resolution. And what we're actually picking up, the activity that we're picking up, is kind of a summation of all the incoming excitatory and inhibitory pulses on a neuron. So uh, it's really quite direct uh, summation of of, uh, what you would like to know. It's like, yeah, neuronal synaptic activity. So I think it's good to emphasize that synapses are extremely important for everything that we do and say and, and try to remember. Our, our memory is really dependent on synaptic function. So it makes total sense. And it's often forgotten in Alzheimer's disease uh, as or not forgotten. Perhaps people take it for granted. So we always take about uh, amyloid, we talk about tau. But the essential thing that actually goes wrong very early on is loss of synapses and synaptic dysfunction. And that's why the memory is failing. So targeting synaptic function is really extremely powerful and important. And even in the sort of in the presence of a future where we have monoclonal antibodies to target A beta, synaptic function and improving synaptic function will always be important. And that's the thing that will actually make the difference for the patient. So so as synapses are disrupted in neurodegenerative disease and particularly in Alzheimer's disease. How do we see that in the EEG? What, what is different? We have been using EEG already for a really long time for diagnostic purposes in, in dementia, different forms, but mainly Alzheimer. So what we know is that we see a gradual slowing of brain activity because from the recorded activity, we can measure the typical rhythms that you would expect in a healthy adult. And we know how fast they are supposed to be. So we can see in Alzheimer, we can see a very gradual decline in certain dominant rhythms. And then with some more advanced measures, uh, you can also do things like um, calculate how strongly different regions are interacting in the brain, uh, often called functional connectivity. And um, there you see a gradual, what you would expect, I guess, you, you see a gradual loss of functional connectivity in, in Alzheimer's. So, uh, Dr. Dahan, maybe you can summarize kind of the key findings and then give us some context about um, what you think is interesting about those findings. What we saw in this uh, study in in a relatively short time span, relatively smaller group, but we saw exactly on the measure that we would like to see it in, the theta power is for us an important measure because the theta rhythm is relatively slow activity that you don't want to have, but that's what we 
see appearing in Alzheimer's disease. There you saw an, a gradual increase in the placebo group, and here we saw really a nice trend towards stabilization and even a significant uh, change in, in the central region. Then on top of that, we saw the positive results in the connectivity, where you see a slight improvement in functional connectivity in the alpha band, where the alpha activity is faster activity and is good, activity that you want to keep. And the connectivity looks at communication between regions, so we saw a relatively stronger connectivity in the alpha, in the treated group, which is also for the connectivity measures that we use, the AEC, I, I will not go into the technical details for here, but um, I regard this measure at, uh, now as the, the most robust and, and reliable measure. And also this frequency band, so the alpha band is the band that you would like to see an effect in, and, and that's where it is. It's yeah. really yeah. powerful. I mean, it yeah. improves your connectivity. So, it's yeah. And in placebo, it goes down, as you expect, in such a short time frame even. And with the therapy, it improves. So I was actually, it, this is more than we hoped for, actually, more than I hoped for. Yeah, yeah. So the two of you have been involved in a lot of studies with, with the EEG, some yeah. of which were therapeutic studies yeah. as well. Tell us a little bit about you know, the, the magnitude of these changes, you know, what you've seen elsewhere, and just give us a little context around yeah, so studies. I'll start because Willem is, of course, the expert here. But we really think that EEG is under-recognized as a, as a powerful tool for synaptic function. So we try always when we are involved to, to say, well, if you think your drug has, an active, has, has some form of activity that increases synaptic function, let's try EEG. So we have it in some studies. Uh, we actually did um, a phase 2A study with a, with a compound that actually also works on pyroglue A-beta where we also saw an effect. Um, and this is now repeated, and the phase 2B study actually reads out early next year. Yeah, and maybe after that also relatively, I think, relatively patient-friendly uh, um, uh, and available. This whole increase in the slow theta power during Alzheimer's disease, if you look at the numbers, it looked like quite small change in absolute sense. But still, it's the direction is, I think, what counts. In the natural course, you just don't see stabilization or improvement. I think that that's what actually surprised me here to see this in this trial already, uh, in, this, in this sense. Uh, so the, it's, it's actually a form of target engagement that you have shown now. So the drug enters the brain, it does something, it influences synaptic function, and you measure it. So obviously, we have fluid biomarkers that we're very used to, whether from blood or cerebrospinal fluid. We have imaging biomarkers with, with PET and MRI. And here we have a physiologic biomarker. So the presence of A-beta, the presence of tau, or the absence, uh, that you can measure with the fluid biomarkers. But what EEG gives you is an actual, I would say, picture of the function of the synapses at that moment. So it's a really functional measure. You measure the actual function, while other markers, we have CSF neurogranin, for instance, that just measure, gives you an indication, oh, synapses have gone lost, but that, because there is less of it in the CSF. And here you measure the function, and to such, the temporal resolution is such that you can actually, if your drug actually does something on synaptic function, you will measure it immediately. You will see it immediately. If I may add a little bit from my perspective yeah, as yes, a neurophysiologist, please. I think the nice thing of EEG is that you do measure at a relatively large scale, but you, you can see if your neuronal circuits and larger networks, if they do what they are supposed to do. So you want them to be flexible and being able to accelerate or, or and synchronize and slow and depending on what, what they uh, the, the certain the task. But so the, the um, yeah, you get much more feeling for the function of the, the brain as a whole system. And you need that perspective as well, not just the cellular pathology perspective, but also the larger, I think. It's not perfect yet, but, but there's, there's uh, really a lot there. And it's really, I think, a bridge between the, the, the structural pathology and the cellular level and, and the and cognition. So one of the clearest signals from the study was in our uh, alpha AECC connectivity measure. Yep. Can you give us a little understanding of what connectivity means? Is it a yes. structural connectivity? Is it an electrical connectivity? What? Yeah, with the functional connectivity that we look at, we look at communication between brain regions. In other words, are they more, is their activity more synchronized? And we know that they are connected and this information is being exchanged. In this study, what we did is we used to measure the amplitude envelope correlation. And what we saw here, of course, is the improvement after the, in the treated group, which is, we think, and we know also a bit from previous studies, is beneficial. So in, in very short terms, you say that the connectivity was actually improved upon the treatment. So we have several studies going on with neurologists throughout the United States and in Europe, many of whom are, are not expert neurophysiologists as, as you guys are. 
Um, what is the take home message that you would deliver to the expert neurologist who perhaps isn't an EEG uh, person themselves? Yeah, so I would say EEG is a widely available technique that is able to measure change in a relatively short time span. And it can be used for both effect monitoring purposes, but also I think more often for diagnostic purposes than you would think. EEG sort of gives you an enormous amount of information that is actually not possible to get that information from any other biomarkers. It really adds to the information that you get from your fluid biomarkers, your MRI. This is a whole new world that actually opens up with EEG. There's a lot of more things that you can do on the diagnostic level, but also in measuring effects of drugs. So I think what we have seen in this small, clearly designed pilot study is very hopeful for the target engagement for this particular drug. And it needs to be proven, of course, on a longer term in a different population, et cetera, et cetera. But we are confident that it will be there. It's been wonderful having you. Obviously, it's been a long journey since we first started this study, and it's great to yeah. have the results out yeah, here true. at the uh, CTAD meeting and hopefully soon in the paper. Um, we'd also be remiss if we didn't thank uh, Dr. Jord Feiverberg, who took over as the leading investigator, yep. along with uh, Dr. Dahan and, and Dr. Shelton. So thank you both. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you, Tony. It was a pleasure. It was wonderful. Thank you.